Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. So glad you guys joined us this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up and get ready to worship. We're going to sing a song you guys know really well today. So sing it out with me. Silence is the enemy Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety Let it rise Let praise arise Come on, lift your voice We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything We sing with all we are and we claim your victory
God of the rescue, God of the breakthrough, how great is your faithfulness. You're not done yet. Come on, sing it with me. And no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no one could ever comprehend. Your word will be enough, your promise we will trust. The greater things are still ahead.
to sing with you guys. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, and thank you for worshiping with us. And my name is Nicole Parker, and I'm one of the leaders in women's ministry here at the Springs. And speaking of women's ministry, last week, Teddy Sylvia shared some pretty exciting news. We are starting our Bible study that she and I wrote together called Finding Freedom. And I just happen to have the book right here with me. It is a study on Galatians. And one of the reasons we're so excited about this study is because we wanted to create a study where anyone can learn how to study, understand, and apply the Bible while in community with other women. And on top of that, ladies, we know how busy we are, so there's no homework. To say we're excited is a bit of an understatement. In fact, we also believe it's going to be a good time. Now, I don't want you to just take my word for it, so we decided to share some bloopers from their video sessions that go along with the study. Watch your screens. Okay. I just want you both to know one thing. Yeah. <laughs> you may be whispering, but we have microphones. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, okay, well, good. Run, run that back. Yeah, it's going to make you laugh. Yeah, you have <laughs> Run, what are you doing? Oh, what God. did you just do? Okay. What are you doing, dude? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> okay, that's okay. All right, all right. Start over. Just start over. You don't need to give me the sign. Let's just go. Okay. Check us out. Come here. Be our style. Be our stylist. Just got the feeling. <laughs> No, no, she's no, crying. No, she's <laughs> crying. Okay. <laughs> it's a, it was so. And I know. <laughs> the camera's rolling. I know. I know. I said don't lie because you're in church because you say that almost every Sunday. And you had that in the original script. So my bad. Can I take no, it to the top good. of that? I just want y'all to know that I laughed obnoxiously and ridiculously for like 10 straight minutes. I probably annoyed the camera crew, but see, when you're with Teddy Sylvia, that's how much fun you'll have. So imagine how much fun you're gonna have if you join us for six weeks, starting February 1st. And men, don't think that we don't want you to have fun. So we're providing an opportunity for you to also do a men's study on the book of Galatians, also starting February 1st. Now for all you parents out there like me who are wondering, well, Who's going to watch my cute little blessings? Don't worry, we've got you covered. There will be free child care. So now, yes, amen to that. So all y'all have to do is sign up after the service. You can do that outside in the lobby or, of course, online at thesprings.net. I personally don't care how you sign up. I just don't want you to miss this opportunity because on a personal note, my life didn't change until I learned God's word and got connected with others. And one way that you can actually get connected today is easy. On every seat, there is one of these connect cards. Or if you're watching online, it's on our website. But either way, find this card and fill it out. If this is your first time here, there's even a box that you can check that says, hey, today is my first time here. We want you to know that even in a church this big, you matter to us, which is why one of our pastors would love to be able to reach out to you this week. And for all of you who call this church home, this card is not just an informational tool, but a relational one as well. It's how we can lead you to your next best steps or, of course, uh, pray over any prayer requests you may have. Either way, don't forget to take this out uh, with you and put it in the baskets on your way out. Now, in the meantime, let's continue with week three of a series that I can honestly relate to called I've Got Issues. Watch your screens.
Hey, 9 o'clock, glad you're here. How you doing today? Good to see you guys. Hey, my name's Brian. Welcome to Church at the Springs. Uh, we are one church at three different locations. So if you're at one of our campus locations, I want to take a moment to say what's up to you. And the many of you watching online from coast to coast, we're glad that you're with us as well. Uh, like Nicole said, we're in week three of a series called I've Got Issues. You know, you know we tend to think like it's my, it's my parents' issues or, or it's my kids' issues issues. It's my sibling. Yeah, it's my, it's my brother. He's the one with issues. But how many of you know it's a freeing day when you can just begin to admit, I've got issues. And so this series has just kind of been a collection of talks where we come together and say, we've got issues and we need some help. This series has primarily been a series about emotional wellness. In week one of this series, we talked about this guy. We talked about anger, right? How all of us get angry some of us more than others. And uh, th there are a number of different ways that the Bible can help us combat our anger. Last week, we talked about anxiety and worry and how when worry and anxiety dominate our mind, it, it, it keeps us from living the kind of life that God intended for us to live. And so uh, it was a great message. I would encourage you, if you missed either of the first two installments of the series, uh, go back and uh, check them out on demand on our website or on YouTube. Finally, this week, I want to talk to you uh, on the subject of insecurity, uh, something that I wish I, I, I didn't have as much experience with, but uh, I feel like I'm the authority on this because I, I can oftentimes be insecure. And, and if I'm honest with you, my insecurity a lot of times can drive me to to, to kind of be desperate for other people's approval. And, and so as I kind of look at the, the story of my life, there have been so many seasons where I've done things, said things, and even become certain things that God didn't intend for me to become simply because I was, I was a people pleaser. And in, and in many ways, I still am. And so um, if you can relate in any way, uh, this, this message is for us. So um, I'm excited for this message today. If you're taking notes, I want to give this message the title, I Crave Approval. I Crave nice. Approval. As some of you, like me, are old enough to remember a time when ride-sharing wasn't a mainstay for commuters, a time when Yelp reviews weren't more important to us than prices were, and, and a time when our purchasing habits weren't solely based on customer reviews. Uh, you probably remember a time when uh, we just kind of like crowdsourced our decision-making, right? We'd ask people something like, on a scale of 1 to 10, what did you think? You remember this? Like, that's how things were back then. But, but nowadays... Nearly every decision that we make pertaining to dining, purchasing, or travel is informed by customer reviews and approval ratings. In fact, one recent study revealed that 90% of us, 90% uh, look for approval ratings and customer reviews before making uh, lifestyle decisions. Um, I'll probably admit to you that I am within that 90 percentile, right? Uh, last weekend, for instance, I took my youngest son, Cademan, on a trip for his 10th birthday. Uh, we got deep into the heart of the Smoky Mountains. This is one uh, picture that we got of the two of us. We had a great time. And, and I told him right off the bat, I said, buddy, you got to understand you are coming of age. This is a man trip, okay? Uh, there will not be any paved trails, no kale salads, okay? We're eating meat. We're hiking deep into the heart of the forest where there is no cell reception. And, of course, he ate it up. He was so excited, but... What you got to know is uh, I, I looked into a number of different customer reviews in order to figure out what we should do. Every restaurant where we dined, every trail we hiked, just about everywhere we went and everything we did was informed by other people's approval ratings. Well, throughout the course of the trip, my son picked up on this, right? And, and he kind of figured that this is something he should be doing too. And so every now and then he would rate me. So like one night I made burgers, I grilled some burgers out and, and uh, the, he took his first bite and he was like, ooh, dad, that is juicy and medium rare. Aren't you proud that my 10-year-old can recognize a medium rare burger? Come on, dads. And, uh, and he says, dad, that's, that's five stars right there. I was like, okay, all right, I'm doing all right. But uh, there were other times, like uh, one time we were at a restaurant, I was signing a check and he looked at my handwriting and he was like, ooh, one star and that's generous, right? Like... <laughs> I was like, man, that's harsh. But, but he, he, he's starting to pick up on this whole idea of approval ratings. Later on in the trip, I posted this picture on Instagram along with a couple others just to help people see how much fun my son and I were having. 
And Cademan looked over my shoulder and saw me doing this. He said, Dad, are you, are you posting those pictures on Instagram? I said, yeah, buddy, I am. And he goes, wow, that's cool. Dad, how many followers do you have? And I'm like, well, I mean, I, I've got a few. You know, he said, Dad, come on, how many? And I told him the number, and he was like, wow, Dad, are all of those people going to like our pictures? And I was like, well, I mean, probably not all of them. He, he cut me off. He's like, are all of those people going to like us? And I thought, is, is that what I'm teaching my son? Is this how I'm raising my son to think that his approval rating is based on how many likes he gets on Instagram? See, I, this is not how I want to raise my kids. This is not what I want my kids to see when they see me. But so often, my insecurity drives me to, to do things and post things and, and be things simply because I can't stand the idea of anyone else not liking me. I can't stand the idea of being made fun of or looked down upon or, or let go in some way or another. No, so, so, so in, be, because of my insecurity, I'll, I'll often do certain things just so that other people will approve. Maybe you can say the same. Can we just be honest today? We crave approval, do we not? In fact, one leading psychology journal said it this way. There, there are certain core needs shared by every person on the planet. Some of those needs are physical, such as food, water, and air. We also have emotional needs, and once our physical needs are met, filling our core emotional needs becomes our number one priority in life. Well, watch this. Whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, the desire for validation is one of the strongest motivating forces known to man. We crave approval. Can we just admit that today? I'll go first. Hi, my name is Brian. Hi, Brian. So I was really hoping that would work. <laughs> and I'm insecure. I struggle with people pleasing. I tend to care way too much what people think of me. And my guess is many of you can say the same. But my hope today is that by the end of this message, we'll be able to say that we are recovering people pleasers. Because what I want to do today is spend some time in God's word and give you three ways to combat this desperate need for other people's approval. So listen, if you got access to God's word, would you do me a favor and turn or swipe to Galatians chapter 1? I want to give you a little bit of context before we dive in, but we'll be there in just a moment. Galatians chapter 1 in the New Testament of the Bible. Here's what's going on in the city of Galatia. A man by the name of the Apostle Paul, you may have heard of him, formerly Saul, now Paul, has planted a church in this region or the city called Galatia. Now, one of the, the interesting dynamics that was happening here is that this was a young church full of young believers. And they were young believers who um, were, were just becoming familiar with the good news. They were just becoming familiar with the gospel. But there were false teachers coming in and teaching false gospels, uh, 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 contrary to the things that Paul was teaching. One particular group, one religious sect was called the Judaizers. The Judaizers came in, and they essentially taught that you still had to earn God's approval. Now, what Paul understood was that God had already pre-approved us. Now, uh, those of you who, who get junk mail every now and then, which is most of us, you probably get certain things in the mail that say that you're pre-approved. You ever seen this? You're pre-approved for certain financing or pre-approved for a certain kind of loan. Now, most of the time, what do you do with that? You tear it up and throw it in the garbage. Why? Because you know that's a cute little statement, but you're eventually, it's going to cost you something. Amen? Like, so you just, you rip it up and throw it away. But see, what Paul understood is that because of what Christ did on the cross, we are pre-approved, and the only thing that following Jesus in salvation costs us is our pride. That's it. Because Jesus paid it all. Can I get an amen? Jesus paid it all. 
But that's not what the Judaizers were teaching. They, they were teaching that you still had to earn God's approval. And what Paul writes this letter to the Galatians to help them understand, what it's all about is this. You can live from God's approval or for man's approval, but you cannot do both. Let me say that again. You can live from God's approval or you can live for people's approval, but you cannot do both. So as we read this verse and as we go through these points today, I want you to be thinking about this. Whose approval am I living for? Am I living from God's or for people's? Here's what Paul says in Galatians 1.10. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. For if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Now, I love this because there are some strong words in this verse. And, and I think one of the words that is the strongest is simply the word obviously. He says, well, well, obviously, there was something obvious about Paul's life that helped people see that he was not concerned about the approval of people. He said, well, why was it so obvious? Well, for one, Paul volunteers, voluntarily stepped away from the religious elite, a group of people known as the Pharisees. He spent many years training to be a part of this group. And when he stepped away, his approval ratings began to fall. But he wasn't concerned about other people's approval. On many occasions, Paul was warned to stop talking about Jesus. <laughs> but he didn't. And, and, at which point, get, he was thrown into a Roman prison. If you know anything about Roman prisons, they had a reputation for being uh, uh, exceedingly and abundantly violent and dangerous but even there, he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Why? Because he wasn't concerned about his approval rating. If I had more time, I could go on and on about the number of reasons that the Galatians had, the, the number of uh, the, the evidence that they had to convince them that, that Paul was not concerned about the approval of man. He wasn't after pleasing people. He was living from the approval of God, not for the approval of man. So look at me. To the Galatians, it was obvious to them that he wasn't in it for the approval of man. Unfortunately, it's not so obvious for us. Like if your friends and followers on social media scrolled through your posts, would it be obvious to them that you're living from the approval of God rather than for the approval of man? Would the people in your workplace your coworkers, would they, would they watch your work ethic? Would they watch your day-to-day -day activity? Would they hear your, your water cooler conversation and conclude, well, well, obviously, he isn't after the approval of man. Would the people in your own home and in your social circles, would they conclude, obviously, he or she isn't concerned about people-pleasing, but, but God-pleasing is what they're really all about. Would, would your peers in your middle school, high school, or college, would they watch you? Would they see you? Would they, would they conclude, obviously? See, it was obvious when it came to Paul, but it's not as obvious when it comes to us. And again, my hope is that by the end of this message, when Monday hits, it'll become more obvious that you're not after the approval of man because you're living from the approval of God. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. I want to give you three ways today to overcome the need for approval. I want to encourage you to write this first one down. First one is this. Resist the comparison trap. By the way, how many of y'all knew that there was a mouse trap emoji? I didn't know that was a thing, but evidently it is. Resist the comparison trap. It is. We can get trapped in this cycle of comparison. Here's what the Bible says. Paul writes another letter to a church in Corinth, and he says this. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. He says, don't compare yourself with somebody who commends themselves. Now, here's the question. Who back then commended themselves? Well, it was ultimately the religious teachers of his day that would teach through coercive and flashy means, and they would commend themselves. Paul says, I don't, I don't dare compare myself with those who 
commend themselves. Who commends themselves today? Can we just 2022 this for a moment? I, I would say we shouldn't dare compare ourselves with social media influencers who commend themselves. We shouldn't dare com com compare ourselves with TV celebrities who commend themselves. We shouldn't dare compare ourselves with people who make more money than us, with a corner office that's bigger than ours, who commend themselves. We shouldn't dare compare ourselves with an airbrushed image of what beauty should look like on some magazine. Don't compare yourself with someone who commends themselves. See, comparison is toxic. Comparison is dangerous. And here's why. Comparison kills contentment. There's something about comparison that hinders our ability to enjoy and appreciate the things that God has given us. Case in point, a couple weeks ago, I, I, I hopped on the phone with a friend of mine who for uh, a while had been a, a, a part of our staff. Um, she was one of our student ministry assistants here at the Springs. And uh, her and her husband recently relocated uh, to uh, a, a city in Georgia. And I got on the phone with her and started to ask her about her new digs, right? Tell me about your new house. Is it going well? Have you made some friends? And, and more importantly, have you found a good church? And so she started to tell me, yeah, we, we visited a few, but there's one in particular that reminds us so much of the Springs. And she started to talk about how friendly the people are and, and, and how amazing the worship and the preaching is. And, you know, how it just reminds her of back home. And, and, and then she started to talk about their youth ministry. I said, well, yeah, tell me about that. Because I know she's passionate about working with students. And she started to tell me how, oh, my goodness, they have so many volunteers that they need to invent new positions for these volunteers to, to serve in. And, and they've had so many teens come back since COVID hit. And they're bringing friends. And it's blowing up. And they're, they can't even fit in the space where they're meeting. And she's going on and on and on and on. And you think that inside I would have been like, yes. I prayed that you would find a church like this. But can I be really honest with you? That's not what I was thinking. <laughs> what I was thinking was, was, man, that's not what it's been for us. We've had a hard time getting and retaining volunteers since COVID hit. We've had a hard time getting kids to come back. Which is funny that I was dwelling on that and not thinking about the fact that just about every single week we have teenagers come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Every month we have teenagers getting baptized and going public with their faith. Every, every week we have students bringing friends from school who are unsaved and hearing the good news for the first time. We have volunteers coming and getting, like, God is doing great things. But isn't it funny in that moment, look at me, isn't it funny how in that moment I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was competing because I was comparing. How often do we do this, friends? How often do we find that comparison kills contentment? I liked my house. Until I saw yours. <laughs> I enjoyed my vacation. Until you posted about yours. <laughs> I loved my car. Until I drove yours. <laughs> right? This is what happens, right? We buy things with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Like, this is what we do because we compare. <laughs> Come on, who am I talking to, right? And so, so really, what Paul is is admonishing us to do is just to resist the comparison trap. He says, don't do it. Here's my encouragement to you. Here's the application here for this first point. The next time that you find yourself comparing, just take a moment to stop and pray and thank God for what he has given you. There's something about just taking a moment and just letting the Holy Spirit remind you of all the different ways that God has blessed you all the ways that he's provided for you, all the ways that he's been there for you when you didn't think you were going to make it through whatever you were going through. It's in that moment that contentment replaces competition. Resist the comparison trap. Here's the second way to combat this need for approval. Number two is this. Give people's opinions the proper 
wait. Sometimes what we do is, we, you know, we, we can get 10 people speaking into our lives and nine people give us compliments and encouragement, but one person offers us some criticism and that's the only thing we can think about. Are you with me? This is what we do because we don't give people's opinion the proper weight. The Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul says, as for me, honestly, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by human authority. I love this. He says, I don't even trust my own judgment at this point. <laughs> but look what, look what he says in verse 4. He says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove that I'm right. Why? Because it is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. In other words, translation, it is God's opinion that matters most. Give people's opinions the proper way. Now, look at me. I don't want you to mishear this. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you should ignore every piece of advice and feedback that people give you. If someone calls you out on a pattern of sin in your life and holds you accountable because you call yourself a believer in Jesus, listen, give that some more weight. All I'm trying to say is make sure that when someone gives you their opinion, their opinion is rooted in God's opinion. Give people's opinions the proper weight. When I was a kid, I remember there was this one, um, this one element on, on the playground that was called the seesaw. Remember the seesaw? Some of, we're in the South. Some of y'all call it the teeter-totter. I grew up in the Midwest. I don't know what you call it, call it down here. But, um, but I, I remember the seesaw. And, and one of the things that my friends and I would do, if you don't know what a seesaw is, basically it's just kind of this, this balance board, right, with a fulcrum in the middle. And you try to get people of equal weight on either side so that they kind of bounce off the ground and go back and forth. And it's super fun, right? Um, my friends and I thought the seesaw was pretty cool. But eventually um, we thought it was pretty boring. And so we decided to use it as a catapult. <laughs> Don't judge. So what we would do is we would put like the real skinny petite kid on one side and all the slightly obese kids on the other side. And on the count of three, we'd be like, all right, go. And they'd jump and this kid would just like he would just fly, you know what I mean? Like he would take flight. <laughs> this is what we would do. By the way, have you noticed that there are no seesaws on playgrounds anymore? <laughs> I might have had something to do with that, <laughs> like, right? Um, but that, I think, is a good picture of what Paul is describing here. Because what we often do is we take man's opinion and we put a whole lot of weight on that side. Yeah, man, that's a good point. Yeah, you're right. If everyone else is doing that, I should be doing it too. And so we put weight over here, and all of a sudden we catapult God's word we forget, we expel God's opinion so that we listen to man. What would it look like if we were to put more weight on the side of God's word and less weight on the side of God's opinion? Then some of those opinions that people give you, some of those comments they post on Facebook, hello somebody, they wouldn't matter as much and they wouldn't get to you as much because what's getting stored in here is God's word and not man's opinion. I can't tell you how many times in ministry I hear people say things like, well, uh, Pastor, uh, my, my girl and I are thinking about moving in together. Now, they're not married. They're not even engaged. But they're like, we're, we're going to move in together. And, and generally, translation is we're physically active, right, of course. And, and they'll say, like, you know, we think it's a good idea because, I mean, come on, like, you would never, you would never buy the car without test driving it, right? Like, and, I, and I, some of you, I know, you're like, you're like whoa. Like that's, that's, hard. Like that's kind of offensive. But here's the thing. This, this is how the world operates. Like this is how the world thinks. So I'll say, like, I don't see the big deal. And I have to walk them through scriptures to help them understand, like, God's word has some stuff to say about that. Right? I'll have people say, like, in my age group, that people say, like, well, listen, man, like, you may not have a lot of money in the bank, but you need to live life to the fullest. So you spend what you can, and then for everything else, there's MasterCard. I mean, who cares if you go into debt, right? You're making memories. When the Bible says very specifically in Proverbs that the borrower is slave to the lender. The Bible has a lot to say about that, but the problem is we put a lot of weight on human opinion and not enough weight on God's word. And then 
we're surprised when life doesn't turn out like we thought it would. A lot of times, I know like you come to church and, and preachers like me, like we talk about why you need quiet time and why you need to spend time in God's word as though it were just part of a religious checklist. But I'm just telling you, this is why. This is why. If you don't get to know God's word, if you don't store his opinion in your heart, then inevitably you're going to put too, wet, too much weight on the opinion of man. And what a healthy life looks like is giving God's word more weight than the words of man. Here's number three. How do you combat this desperate need for approval that's driven by our insecurity? Well, you trust the love of God and not the likes of man. What are you going to do? You're going to trust the love of God, not the likes of man. The Bible tells us this in Proverbs. It says, the fear of human opinion disables I love this next part, but trusting in God, trusting in his love, well, it protects you from that. The original language this was written in ancient Hebrew suggests where it says the fear of human opinion disables. It literally suggests that like it hooks, like it's, it's like a trap. It's a, it's a hook. And how many of you know that we can get hooked on likes? We can absolutely get addicted to it. I read this article earlier this week about a man by the name of Ramit Chala. I hope that I'm pronouncing that name correctly. But Ramit at one point joined Instagram and immediately discovered a problem. A lot of his friends that were already on Instagram started to get upset with him because he wasn't liking their posts enough. They, they honestly felt like he was ignoring them or snubbing them or, or ghosting them per se, right? And so... Um, Chala is actually a computer programmer, and so what he did is he created this bot. Now, I'm not uh, a techie guy. I'm not a software engineer, so I hope I'm describing this correctly, but he basically created this bot that would automatically like every single post by every single one of his friends on every single one of his social media platforms. And I love this. Uh, the article said this. When he did this, he became incredibly popular on Instagram. His follower count skyrocketed. His pictures were liked more often. He became so insta-famous, in fact, that someone stopped him on the street to congratulate him on his insta-magnificence. <laughs> I love it. Now check this out. He was interviewed, and here's what he said. He said, I think people give way too much value to the like. He said, people are addicted to the extent that we experience withdrawals. We are so driven by this drug that getting just one hit elicits truly peculiar reactions. He went on to compare the experience of watching a social media post skyrocket in popularity to smoking crack cocaine. We are so addicted to the like. We are so addicted to the approval of others. And what the Bible reminds us is that if we trust the likes of man more than the love of God, we'll be caught in this endless cycle of approval addiction. It's like a hook. But when you trust God's love, it, it frees you from that. So I think back to this trip I was on last week with my son. And uh, there was this one incredible moment when we summited this mountain. It was the highest point that my son has ever uh, hiked in his life. And, and we're sitting on this cliff just, just below the summit. And uh, dads, I don't know if you can relate to this, but like I've... <laughs> I'll just be real with you. I've gotten a lot of things wrong as a dad. Like, there have been a lot of moments where I'm like, bro, you screwed that up so bad. <laughs> like, honestly. But, I, but honestly, this was one of those moments that I went into thinking, I've got to get this right. Because, like, we're sitting there on this cliff. Let me just see if I can paint a picture for you. We're sitting on this cliff overlooking the Smoky Mountains. We can see three states from our vantage point. It's lightly snowing around us. The only sound is the whistling of wind in the trees. And we sat for about four or five minutes silently just taking in the view. And I just had this, this moment of clarity where I was like, man, whatever I say next, 
whatever conversation we have on this cliff, like, I'm pretty sure my son's going to remember this. So, like, you ever had that voice inside your head? Like, bro, don't screw this up. You know, it's like, whatever I say, like, this is going to matter. And so I just took a moment and I just silently prayed and said, Holy Spirit, would you just guide this moment? Would you help me to say something that is going to sort of unfold my son into the kind of young man that you've intended him to be? And so I said, Cayman, can I tell you something? And he looked right at me and he said, yeah, Dad. And I knew in that moment, like, I had his undivided attention. I said, I just want you to know, like, now that you're 10 years old, you're heading into the next decade of your life, you're going to be tempted pretty often to believe that you're going to have to perform a certain way or change yourself or, 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 or um, identify with certain things just, just in order to get people's approval. But, son, I want you to know you, you don't have to do that because your mom and I, we love you so much. We're so proud of you. You already have our approval. And nothing that you ever do, nothing that you ever say, will ever change that. And I said, son, more importantly, that's also true of God. He is, he is so well pleased with you. Gosh, he loves you so much. Sorry. And I want you to know today that very same thing that Cayman's father wanted him to know on that cliff is the same thing that your heavenly father wants you to know in this room. Boy, does he love you. He is well pleased with you. And you can either live from the approval of God or for the approval of man, but you cannot do both. So what'll it be? Whose approval will matter most? Some of you today, I know you've come in here and for years maybe you've been in church. Maybe you walked away from church and you're starting to find your way back and, and you're just not sure. Like you've, you've believed the sort of thing that the Judaizers were teaching in Galatia that you need to earn God's approval. Look at me. No, you don't. No, you, Jesus earned it for you. You already have his love. You already have his forgiveness. You have the approval of God. He is well pleased with you. He already sees you as a son or daughter. He's just waiting for you to realize it. Today, would you give your life to him? Would you allow him to give you the gift of salvation that he already purchased in Jesus? If you're ready today, would you bow your head and pray with me? Come on, no more wasting time. No more playing religious games. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus and live from his approval rather than for the approval of people, would you just maybe pray this with me? Say, God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that there's nothing that I could ever do that would change the way you love me. So today I put my life in your hands. And for the rest of eternity, I want to follow you, obey you, and worship you because you and you alone are worth my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear God, I've been trying awful hard to make you proud of me. But it seems the harder that I try, oh, the harder it becomes. And I feel like giving up. I'm
prayed that prayer and started a relationship with the God of the universe, and I just want to say congratulations. I want you to find that Connect card and mark the moment. On that Connect card, check the box, I committed my life to Christ. We want to be able to reach out to you tomorrow morning and, and just, just give you a call or send you a text message. And one of our pastors here, uh, Thomas Pesto, is just going to reach out to you and help you figure out where do you go from here in the relationship that you just started. And we want to help you figure out how do you continue and where do you go in this relationship with God. And we want to help you find your best next step here at church at the spring. So in a moment, you can take that Connect card and just drop it in the basket as you leave. You can also uh, give in that way. You can give online at thesprings.net. And if you give here at church at the Springs, I just want to say thank you. If you give here, it makes such a huge impact here in Ocala, in the villages, in Marion Oaks. And as we are gearing up to launch a new campus in Middleton in 2023, and we are so excited that we are going to be doing uh, this, I mean, I mean, opening a new campus and everything that we have going on. But the way that you give helps us just be able to do what we do every single week, week in and week out. And one of those things is Connect. And we are having Connect on February 6th from 4 to 6 p.m. And if you've been on the fence with connect or you're new here and you're trying to figure out where do you go from here in this church or how do you meet people? How do you get plugged in? Your story at the Springs is still being written. And I want you to hear the story of uh, some friends of mine uh, that are actually in my small group uh, that first came to church at the Springs, then came to connect and are now plugged in serving in a group and I want you to hear their story, so watch your screens. Well, I'm Paul Thiel, and this is my, oh, do you want me to, okay, we already started great. <laughs> Let's cut inter, that one. You do all the talking. <laughs> or 
<laughs> All right. Hey, I'm Paul Thiel. This is my wife, Olivia Thiel. Uh, we've been coming to the Springs now for about two years. Um, we have three kids. We have Jacob, Hannah, and Lucas, and Lucas is 11 weeks old. We found the Springs by, we had a friend invite us. There was a lot of young families here that we could relate to and make friends with. The moment we got out of the car in the parking lot, team was out there to greet us and show us the way. We had been here for about one service, and then after that we felt the need to get connected even further. Um, that following week, actually, we came here and uh, to connect, go sit around a table with other people and have that same feeling of, hey, we feel like a, a belonging here. I talked with one of the pastors here, and he got me connected with the usher team. And it was great because I was at the usher team with my our last church back in Mississippi, and it was one of those situations where even in a new environment, I still felt comfortable. One value that we learned was that every member is a minister here, and that relationship that you build off of that table is ultimately why we came back and, and ended up serving here. And you know, it, it kind of breathes life into you and you realize that, hey, look, this is what I am here to do. You know, I am here to serve and, and to hopefully to spread the word of God and, and help them realize that maybe I'm just an usher, but in the end, if they have a great time, they're realizing, hey, this is a church I can become a part of, maybe the next week that they're able to go into the Connect class as well. If you have any doubts or hesitations about coming to Connect, just come. It'll be fun. It'll Your kids will be taken care of. You'll eat, you'll make great friendships, connections, and then you can get plugged in. It really is uh, what helped us grow. We built relationships, our family's grown, and we're able to serve within our church now. Get your connect cards out and check it. <laughs> yeah. She even knew uh, to plug get your connect card out and sign up on the connect card, and that's because Olivia is now on staff with us. So to watch someone go from two years ago that they just came for the first time, and now Olivia is on staff. Paul is a great friend of mine, and they're in our small group, my wife and I, and uh, just great to see. So uh, sign up for Connect. You can drop the Connect card in the basket. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, join us next week as we wrap up the series, I've Got Issues and Go Bucks. Have a good one. <laughs>